You're listening to the Be Better Off Show by Kelly Partners. Well, welcome to the Be Better Off Show, where we try to bring you interesting and amazing people from all over the world. And today, I'm so pleased to have Sir Martin Sorrell, the founder of WPP, which was the world's largest advertising agency, and in his midlife, S4 Capital, which after leaving WPP, he started a new firm, which is now nearly 50% of the size of the firm that he'd spent 30 years building. It's a tremendous story of innovation and resilience. I'm so proud to and pleased to have um, Sir Martin with us today. To give our listeners some context, WPP's market cap today is 11 billion pound. S4 Capital is over 4 billion pound. And we're getting to hear today from the founder of both of those businesses, which is tremendous. So welcome, Sir Martin. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. That flattering introduction, my mother, if she was still alive, would be delighted. Whether, whether it was truthful or not is another question. But anyway, so are you, and you forgot about my third life, which was uh, Sarge's. So before yeah, that. that's right. Like, so it's, you know, for our listeners, I, I was struck when I started reading everything that I could find on Sir Martin, I was struck by the, the strong people that had inspired him. And, and I'll seek your comment on this. Your father was running one of the biggest electrical retailers in the UK. The, the biggest, the, bi- the biggest, the biggest, the biggest uh, in, in, in his day, but it wasn't his own. It was somebody, it was a division of a, an industrial holding company, a conglomerate called Firth Cleveland. It was one of the first conglomerate on the market and run by a, a Wolverhampton-based metal basher. He owned uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers and Firth Cleveland. So it was the retail division of that. My, as I say, my, my father didn't own any of it, not like you or me. Um, he didn't have the opportunity of, of unifying ownership and control. It was he, he managed it, but he treated it. He treated it as though it was his own, actually. So that was one of his strengths and maybe one of his failings. And, and I, it, it did strike me that these, these great mentors that I see through your life and your father passed on this lesson of, of seek some ownership at 40, make sure you get out and do something, but, but Mark... Well, yeah, well, his, his advice wasn't quite that, but he said, he said, find an industry you enjoy, find a company in that industry you enjoy, build a reputation, and then if you feel... That you you know you want to do something on your own, go off and do something on your own. Yeah, t- terrific. And then in your business, I noted that you worked for Mark McCormack at INC yes. in your early career. Yeah. And Mark is another storied entrepreneur. How did you meet him, and how did you come to be in that business, and what did you learn from him? I met him at Harvard Business School. So we we uh, I did a course, an elective course in the second year called management of new enterprises, which was uh, an entrepreneurial course. And, and uh, actually, it was quite amusing in a way. It was for two semesters out of the three semesters in the, the second year. And uh, we always had successes. You know, it was all case studies. Uh, you know, HBS is all, all about how it was all, all, all about the case study method, which I think is a very good method. But when everything was about success, except we did have one failure. We, we had a, an ex-HBS course. A graduate who had gone into a boat building business in New England, and it was a desperate story of sort of bankruptcy and God knows what, and not a great personal life, and lots of strains, and and uh, all this. So that was pretty instructive. But Mark came in as one of the entrepreneurs, and there was a case study around IMG. I actually went to work in a consulting company in just outside New York in Connecticut and uh, Westport, Connecticut, called Glendening Associates. It was quite famous. There was, uh, it was founded by Ralph Glendening, an ex p and guy, and he pulled out a lot of P&G executives, one of whom was Joel Smiler, who was my boss, and who died sadly recently, became a director of WPP at one stage, actually. And Joel made a fortune out of Playtex. He went to work for Norton Simon in the food industry. And then I think he, he took over. I think, I think Playtex was a division of Norton Simon. He spun it out. He made a lot of money. So I went to work for Joel uh, and Ralph Glendening at Glendening Associates. And then, unfortunately, at that time, even if you were a foreigner, you could have been drafted. This was 1968, 69, height of the Vietnamese War. And what people didn't realize was that you could be drafted. So my mum, you know, I was an only child, spoiled only child from Northwest London in the Jewish ghetto of Northwest London. My mother said, you know, there's no way you're going to get drafted. You better come home. Uh, so I, I started to prepare for home and I kept in touch with Mark from that business school case study. And he, he called me and he said, if you're going back to London, why don't you come and run 
uh, my company in London, which he was sort of setting up in London because he had an agent there who he, he used. Uh, unfortunately, when I got to London, I found that he basically promised the, the same job to, to two other people. So, you know, I was one of three people who was, uh, well, actually there were two of us. And then there was uh, somebody else who thought that she was running the business. So it was a bit, a bit fearsome. But anyway, it, it worked out. And I worked for Mark for three or four years. And it was interesting. What did I learn from him? Uh, you know, devil's in the detail. I always remember he, um, he talked about Lou Wasserman, who built a, a personal representation business. And Lou Wasserman had a, a client who was a conductor, a famous conductor, orchestra, a jazz band or something. I don't know. It wasn't, I don't think, a classical orchestra. It was a sort of jazz band. And he, always, he said, I always remember he said, I made sure that you know, his conducting stick or whatever it is, wand or whatever they call it, you know, I made sure that he had that. I had the best one available or whatever it was. And, and he said, I, you know, when Arnold Palmer was playing in a tournament, I made sure that he got, you know, a new pair of shoes, uh, the right size, six and a half or whatever it was, delivered to the tournament. So the devil was in the detail. And Mark was fanatical about detail, very well organized. You know, he had these four by two cards he kept in his inside pocket with the things he had to do today. He had a legal yellow pad with all the things that, that he had to do in the day or the longer term things that he used to you know, scrub them out as he did them. He, he had this wonderful system. Every day he would go back and look at the memos that he'd written a year earlier, which was really interesting. So his, his secretary would always bring out uh, so very methodical, always talked about number of people he employed, never talked about revenues or profitability. So uh, it was always about, and the answer was the company was very much, you know, his life and it was a private company and, um, you know, it was his own, I'm going to say personal money box, if you like. I had equity in a subsidiary. I always remember that, you know, I had about 10% of a thing called IFM UK Limited, you know, that, uh, my Big thing was I've got to have some equity. And uh, the moment that IFM UK started to make money, you know, I would see that the, the, the service charges from the other units in the, in the company would, would siphon off the <laughs> profitability. So uh, Mark was um, – the other funny thing about Mark was uh, I remember uh, it was at the beginnings of the – when I was running WPP, it was the beginnings of the internet in the 90s. And me, um, or maybe 95, and I think Mary Meeker was at Morgan Stanley, a very famous, um, well, she's still famous. She's a partner, I think, of Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins. I think she's starting her own private equity firm. She does a lot of very good work, actually, on the web. Her report every year on the web is really a seminal piece of work. And in Mary Meeker was the analyst at Morgan Stanley, and she, she said to Mark, you know, your, your internet activities at IMG are worth a fortune. Now, Mark didn't really know much about the internet economy. And to be fair, at that time, it was in its development phase. And he thought it was wampum, you know, what the, the what, you know, what wampum was, you know, what's what the US Army and the Cowboys used to give the Red Indians uh, because they valued it, but they, the Army or the, the Cowboys didn't value it. And Mark thought that the equity in the interactive business in IMG was wampum. So he, he, he didn't like to give equity to his employees, his people inside the business. So he gave him some of them what he thought was wampum. And he was right, he was right actually, because IMG Interactive never really, it was run by one of his sons, never really got any traction. And uh, the Kraft, Bob Kraft was a shareholder, you know, the, uh, the owner of the Patriots with one of his sons. And that's how I met Bob Kraft actually, through that. Anyway, we got out, out of that WPP that we owned about three or four or five percent. And we tried to build it, but it really didn't work. But, but Mark, so I'm, I'm, I learned to, you know, a fair bit about how entrepreneurial development, detail, focus on the detail. It's not just about strategy and vision and, and structure. I learned, I mean, Mark had a, quite a complicated structure. It was a, largely a tax-driven private company structure. Uh, I don't think it was particularly unifying. Everybody was running their own empire and it was a bit, too focused around that. Now, of course, it's ended up inside Ari, Ari Emanuel's empire. I mean, it was bought by Teddy Forsman after Mark died, tragically. You know, he, he had a coma. I went to see him 
in in the hospital, you know, so before he sadly died, he had a coma. He sort of collapsed in a surgery in New York when the doctor was doing some sort of procedure and went into a coma. They didn't have a oxygen supply or whenever it had an anesthetic or something like that. And I went to see him. So I'm very sad, but, you know, I learned, I, I would say I learned the devil in the detail. Yeah, so it's an interesting story because at that time he had one of the first really genuinely global businesses before being global was was such a thing in, in professional services. Well, yes, yeah, so it was. Well, because you've got to remember that he started off with Arnold Palmer with a handshake. You know, he, he and Arnold, I met at Wake Forest where Arnold was a, an undergraduate. And just like my father has said, you know, find an industry that is fun and a company in it is fun. Mark, Mark was the ultimate example of that because he was a professional golfer. It was fun, and he decided to make it his business. He said to Arnold, you know, you really got to have somebody look out your affairs. It was a handshake. And Arnold had uh, 10% of IMG. Uh, that, that irritated that you know, he had the big three, Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, Jack Nicholas, or Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Gary, Gary Player. That, that irritated Jack, actually. I think every, every time Jack played and won prize money or – an endorsement, you know, the thought, I think, of 10% of it going to Arnold <laughs> pissed him off. So he went, whilst I was still there, he went and formed Golden Bear Enterprises, which was his management company. I think he took somebody from IMG to do that. Gary Player was fine. And then we we got in, we went into skiing with Jean-Claude Keeley, or Mark did, tennis with Rod Laver, who would yeah. know well down, down under, uh, Jackie Stewart. You know, I met Jackie Stewart in in uh, in Switzerland when Jackie was going to go into the professional management business you know, and didn't in the end. We met him with a Swiss banker called Ellie Zilker, and then Jackie became a client. Gene Shrimpton, and, and you know, Mark had a model agency. He had three mod, big models in that. Gene Shrimpton, who was wonderful, Varushka, and Maudie James. So, uh, so he had a, a model agency as well. So, yeah. so Mark really developed the business, and then he had. You know, the management, IMG, he had Transworld International, which was the film run by Jay Michaels. He had International Literary Management run by Jay Lafay, who was his legal partner, because Mark's trade was legal. He was legal. Yep. a par- partner in a Cleveland, Cleveland firm called Arta Haddon Van Duzer and Wyckoff. <laughs> and that was, that, was, that was based in Cincinnati, number one Air Review Plaza. And I went to Cincinnati the... The, the year that Lake Erie caught fire. You know, everybody talks about climate change. Well, the, the lake was clogged with filth and it actually caught fire that year. So he started off in Cleveland and then uh, Jay Lafay was a partner there too. Anyway, he ran international literary management and Jules Rosen, Rosenthal ran Arnold Palmer Enterprises. And Arnold, you know, was way ahead of his time. He had that umbrella as a, as a branding symbol, you know, the multicolor umbrella. And um, Jack had, Jack Nicholas had Golden Bear Enterprise of Golden Bear and Gary Player was the Black Knight. And um, it was really, really interesting. I mean, Mark was way ahead of his time in personal management, celebrity management. So, you know, that was really, it was an interesting time. I, I, I worked for him for three or four years. The only time that Mark ever got really annoyed with me was when there was a double page spread in the, I think it was the Daily Mirror or something. And uh, when I joined the company, I think Mark was 55. And three or four years later in the Daily Mirror, he was still 55. And I drew attention to that fact. And I think I've got a, a, a slap on the wrist. For that. Very, con- very conscious of his age. Of his age. So it's a great yeah. start, like to have your father with such good commercial experience, to have a you know great educational opportunity through Cambridge and then Harvard, you know across across. Well, my father, my father didn't have any education. He left school at thirteen. Yeah, um, I just saw, I just saw Tom Stoppard's play Leopold Strat, which everybody should be encouraged to see. You know, uh, Tom Stoppard, at a fairly late stage in his life, realized or found out that he was Jewish. And uh, so he's written this very powerful play about a family, uh, family in Austria. And my, my, uh, it starts actually, uh, well, it starts actually in 24, I think it does. But it, it also, uh, it, sorry, it starts off in 1899. 
and uh, this family in, in Vienna. And it's 1899 is the year that I think my grandparents on my father's side came from, I think, Ukraine. I think we think it was either Kiev or Lvov landed in the UK, penniless. And my father and my, my mother, actually, uh, went to Mile End Central in East London. He didn't have any formal education. Having said that, he could recite to his dying day large chunks. And when I say large chunks, I mean pages and pages of Shakespeare, the Talmud. And he was uh, an expert fiddler, uh, meaning uh, expert, expert violinist. violinist. And he he, he won, a, won a music scholarship to the Royal School College of Music, but couldn't take it up. So if you just think about that for a minute, you come from the Ukraine, you're dumped in 1899. My, my grandparents' wedding certificate had two crosses on it for, for my Zayda and my Bubba, as they're, as they're known. And then the four witnesses all signed with crosses. So they didn't speak a word of English. They spoke probably Russian and Yiddish. Yiddish was how they communicated. I remember my grandfather, my grandmother speaking Yiddish. And, um, and so my father had no formal education. So he prized it. So he, he made sure, God bless him, that... Um, I and my mother did too, that I uh, received the very best. And um, they were very, you know, put aside, they made great sacrifices to make sure that that was the case. So that was the, you know, the blooding, if you like. So when I saw actually that play about, you know, different different type of family, I'm, I'm sure my grandparents were not as wealthy as that family de depicted in uh, Vienna. Uh, the roots are there. So I think the roots are... You know, when you see that play, you get a strong feeling as to how your ideas and experiences formed. are formed. So interesting. Yeah. And, you know, like Australia, mm. Australia being basically, you know, a, a heavily immigrant country would, would, would get that. Yeah, we've, we have so much of that here in terms of people bringing their, their sort of bloodline and their experiences that are so formative to their ideas. So in reading about you, it did strike me as a strong influence of your parents and, and that migrant background and then the, the emphasis yeah. on education, the opportunity to study in the US and yeah. at that time come back to, to England. And I hadn't picked up that it was because of this, this draft idea that you came back, but that's really interesting. And Mark yeah. McCormack obviously being a towering figure. So in 1975, you joined Saatchi and Saatchi how did you come to join? Well, I didn't. I, I joined it actually in 77, and at 75, I was working for them as a consultant because I went, you know, I said to my dad, I want to leave Mark McCormack and I want to do something with you. So, with my father, because, you know, we're very close to him. And yet, uh, you know, I couldn't, um, we couldn't work together. I think we were both pretty, pretty strong, strong minded. Anyway, so uh, that didn't work out, you know, but, but in order to get to that, actually, I said to my dad, how am I going to extract myself from Mark McCormack? He said, well, Write Mark a letter that you want, you know, a temporary leave of absence, which I did do. Uh, in 1987, we made our so-called hostile bid for J. Walter Thompson. And I said to you before that Mark used to look back at his correspondence. So, so this was, let's say, another 12 years later, 15 years later, where he writes me a letter in the middle of the the hostile takeover of JWC. He said, "Are you still on a temporary leave of absence?" <laughs> and, and appended the original letter. Anyway, I wrote him the letter, went off to do something with my dad. That didn't work out. And then, you know, I met, I met again a, a guy who I'd known for many years, James Gulliver, who was quite a famous entrepreneur in the UK and built up Garfield Weston's Fine Fair. It was a retail food chain, had built then Oriel Foods. He went off on his own. Shell Company built Oriel Foods through acquisition with Alistair Grant and David Webster. And then they sold that to RCA Corporation. Then asked me why RCA Corporation would buy a food retailing and wholesale business, but they did. It was, I think RCA was dismembered shortly after that. And James made quite a bit of money in those days. And he, I, I went there as his sort of personal financial advisor. I was really his gopher, his bag carrier, his tortoise, as I think. John Brown used to call them at BP. And um, I looked after his investments. And one of his investments, he invested in a company called Sayers Confectioners up in Liverpool, I think it was. Tavener Rutledge in Manchester, a sweet manufacturer. 
Alpine Holdings, a double glazing company, which uh, public company. And then the other thing he invested in was Garland Compton, which was an advertising agency, a bit of a stodgy advertising agency. Ken Gill was the chairman. And Ken said it needed a creative boost. The creative boost was Sarchi's, and Sarchi's reversed themselves into Garland Compton, Sarchi and Sarchi Garland Compton. And uh, James had his shareholding. And, and James said to me, it was really interesting, actually, Brett, you, you'd appreciate this. So James is a food retailer very interested in property and freehold property. And the deal between Garland Compton and Sarches, it was a reverse bid. So Garland Compton bid for Sarches at a multiple, they were selling on the public market, a higher multiple. The Sarches ended up with 40% of the equity, I think it was, or whatever it was. It, it was effectively a controlling, a controlling stake. But the net effect of it was, although the price earnings multiple came down because it was accretive. The net assets per share, because such as had negative net assets, yeah. went to hell in the handbasket. And, and uh, James looked at this and said, no, that's no good. Let's sell the stock. And he had about, he must have had about 5 or 10% of Garland Compton. And he said to me, sell out the position. And that was, that was a desperately bad decision because, you know, five or 10% of Sarge's at its peak, and, you know, yeah. it, it had a bumpy, bumpy time in the end, but at its peak would have been, would have been worth a fortune if he sold it out. But the reason he sold it out was he was very focused, not only on earnings per share and obviously dividends per share, but also on net assets per share. And as a food retailer, he couldn't get round he couldn't get around the idea that this was dilutive on net assets per share, although on an earnings basis it was accretive. It's a quite interesting thing. Anyway, I and that's, and that's that. interesting because that's like the mid seventies, or yeah. is that right? So where yes. where today, the even today where people better understand the value of intangible assets, it's understandable that in the mid seventies somebody might have looked at that and thought, well, how does this work? Mm. No, no, it, it's. Um, no, it was it was a shell operation that that um, uh, the Garland Compton was injected. You know, there were a lot of Slater Walker. Jim Slater was a famous banker, asset stripper. Some people called him. You know, in the Goldsmith, Jim Hans Hansen uh, era. And there was another one called another asset stripper, as they called them, Percy Matthews. He ran a thing called Pat Matthews. Right. His name was Percy, uh, known as Pat. And his, his company is called First National Finance Corporation, FNFC. And Pat had a shell company called the Birmingham Crematorium, which was a crematorium company. And they injected, would you believe, this, this advertising agency called Garland Compton into it. So it became known as Garland Compton. And then Garland Compton bought Sarches, which effectively reverts, take over, became Sarchi and Sarchi Garland Compton. And then, and then the Americans, Compton Advertising, which is a big Proctor agency, very big Proctor agency, very revered, stodgy, run by O. Milton Gossett. <laughs> that was the, pre you know, this American habit, your second name becomes your first name. Your first name. He was, we, we never knew what O was. I can't remember what O was, but it was, his name was Milt, and it was O. Milton Gossett, and Robert Huntington was the, was the 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 number two that any anyway, and Jerry Germain was the, the 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 chief financial officer, and um, they had twenty percent of the public company, and that was a problem because Morris and Charles really didn't like the fact that these Americans had twenty percent. So we devised this one. I think it's one of the best deals we ever did. We devised this structure. We created a new public company which made a bid for the old one, such and such a Golden Compton, in which the Americans had 20%, which, which Morris had their stake. And we convinced the Americans to stay in the subsidiary. So we make an offer for the 80% of such and such a Golden Compton that they don't own. Yep. So it shrinks the company. So Morris and Charles' stake, whatever it was, becomes 25% more significant. So they get more control. And the Americans are stuck in this subsidiary, no dividend rights. I mean, obviously, essentially, with a, with a new hold car over the top. Yeah, yeah. And we couldn't believe 
We couldn't believe the Americans accepted it. It was very, very funny. And I remember Morris got really pissed off with me because I told the, the Americans at one stage in the negotiations, we're going to change the name of the company from Sachin Sachi Garland Compton, or Sachin Sachi Compton, it was called, to Sachi and Sachi Company Limited. So their name would come off the public company. And one, I remember it was one Thursday or Friday night, I said to the, the guy I was negotiating, because I did a lot of the negotiation, you know, we're going to call it Sachi and Sachi Company. And, and, and Morris wanted to leave that until the very end. He wanted to sort of drop it in at the end. And I, you know, I was upfront about it. And Morris went absolutely bananas. But, but the Americans accepted. I mean, they, they were fine. Why, why they ever agreed to that, I just do not know. Um, it made no, you know, we said, well, we wanted to get the structure, such and such a company together so that we could build uh, a thing called such and such developments in which, by the way, I had a 20 percent shareholding. That was going to be because um, Gordon White, who was Jim Hansen's partner in Hansen Trust, went off to America and uh, somewhat controversially he had a 20 percent stake in the Hansen Trust U.S. personally. And um, it, such and such a developments, if you went back and looked at the history, I had 20%. Unfortunately for me, you know, or, or, and, and I think this was just sort of deliberate by Morris and Charles, you know, that, that never got off the ground. But it was used was a, as, a, 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 a stalking horse. Stalking horse. <laughs> it was using a stalking horse to get the Americans, because the Americans were terrified that we were going to go off and do something crazy, I think, in such and such a development. So I think the reason that they chose not to go into the new public company yeah. is yeah. that, you know, they were terrified that we would go ma Michiganer, as they say in, uh, in Yiddish, um, that we go Michiganer on the, uh, on the such and such development. So quite fun time, actually. Very, very but What did you learn, like, from the, the Saatchi brothers in, in that, because it was obviously formative to, to you going to WPP, what did you learn from, from the pair of them? Well, I, you know, I, I, I often said, you know, I, I, I learned at the sort of the knee of Joel Smilo at Glen Denning, uh, sort of the hip uh, of um, of James Gulliver, um, and then at the shoulder of Morris and Charles. And I, I think, you know, with James Gulliver, it was about deals and how you build a shell operation, um, and and through through acquisition, and James had a wonderful team, Alistair Grant, who sadly died a few years ago, and David Webster, who was a finance guy, investment banker, very, very, very clever guy, uh, as well as Alistair. Alistair was the marketing guy, and James was the, the overall guy. Um, you know, tough guy, Glaswegian born, quite some interesting aspects to his character, which I won't go into, but you know, got caught out on that... Um, said he went to Harvard Business School and, and was exposed as not having gone there. Um, and, you know, it, 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 during the midst of the distillers bid, which was very, very controversial, that really broke that bid apart. But with, with you know, with James, I learned about sort of financial engineering, if you like, a little bit, and, and building, building show. And with, with Morris and Charles, I, I think I, Morris, I think, was very, very good strategically. Charlie was the sort of entrepreneurial engine, the, the guy who pushed. I always remember when we won the British Airways account or the agency one, Charles walks in and says, you know, that's, it's a wonderful day. Just prepare yourself for the day when we lose it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, he always looked. So, but Morris strategically was extremely good. And Morris always had a really interesting ability. He was really keen to reduce everything to a piece of paper. So, you know, because we focused on the financial and administrative part, and it was a bit of a mess, frankly, when, when, when Garland Compton acquired Sarches, literally the accounting records of Sarches were put into tea boxes and removed by, by a pantechnicum to the accounts department of Sarche and Sarche Compton down in, down in Bristol, in Bath, <laughs> and it was a complete and utter mess. And um, let's say the accounting records were lacking. Control of expenses was lacking. 
um, it was a, it, it was a bit messy at the beginning. We, you know, we got it together in the end, but it was a, a, a little bit chaotic. But at that time, Morris uh, Morris used to produce, loved to produce these forms that laid out on a piece of paper, and you had to extend the piece of paper because it was so big. Uh, you know, a folded piece of paper exactly where we the company was. You know, where it was in terms of performance against budget, the variances. Charles used to. Um, you used to pretend he was somebody else on the phone when he was speaking to journalists. So it was quite funny. We had we had, we had lots of fun in those days. It was. Uh, how do they we still go have, from it? We how still do, have fun. <laughs> how, how do you think they went from you know a, a startup effectively to the largest ad agency in England and 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 I think the US? Well, we we, we the world. I mean, we we we've done it twice in that way. Sarge has became the biggest one in the world, and then WBP afterwards. Um, how did they do it? But they were extremely ambitious. I think the one thing that I would say, you know, there were two things. One is it, it, you, it, nothing was impossible. That was a favourite phrase. It, nothing was impossible as long as you, nobody else got credit for it except for Morris and Charles. And, that, you know, that was the, the unwritten rule. I, I think one of the reasons for tensions with Tim Bell was around that. Tim got a lot of notoriety when he worked with Gordon Reese on Mike, Margaret Thatcher's campaigns. And, and you know, I think that, you know, made Tim, a, 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 he really was the third brother, if you like. And um, you know, I think that was sort of one thing. The other thing is that I think Morris and Charles thought you could you run these businesses by remote control. And, you know, whilst, you know, that famous quote in retail, that retail is detail, I, 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 I don't, you know, I think you have to have a balance between the strategic and the, and the, the detail. You can't, you know, managers, manager-led companies, what tends to happen, a bureaucracy develops. And there's you know, all the strategy stuff and they forget about the detail. And the fact is, the devil is in the detail and you have to do both. Yeah. You have to have a you know, strategic vision, you have to have a structure. And you know, if you absent yourself from the detail, it's not that you, could, you necessarily want to impact the detail. It's, but you, you have to you know, know that. Yeah, you have to, because that gives you, you know, I remember when I was at, such as I used to look at every hire over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and and you know we had a hundred thousand people, whatever it was, and people used to say, "God, yeah, yeah, isn't he isn't he going a bit too far? Isn't he? You know, it's a bit crazy." But the reason I did it was not because I wanted to say stop doing it or do this. It was you get a very good understanding. You know, if you said to me, "I'll, I'll stick you on," I don't know, some barrier reef island. Um, you know, some beautiful barrier reef island and you can have three pieces of information uh, about, uh, yeah, I would say, like-for-like like revenue growth, like-for-like like headcount growth and the cash position with, with maybe some knowledge about what deals are being done because, you know, it's a cash generative business. And when yeah. you look at those three three numbers and the balances between them, uh, you know, you take S4's results the first half this year, we're up 49% like-for-like like Revenue growth and our headcount is up fifty six percent, like for like, and that gives you a good idea of what's happening inside the business and the cash flow as well. So, so I I, I think you know you have to know the detail. And, you're renowned and I'm, for knowing the detail. It's interesting. It's very often commented on how well not 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 not, 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 not not necessarily knowing. I mean, I remember um, you know going back to that Leopoldstadt play. You know, Sir Jules Thorne left. Vienna in 1938, the same year that Sigmund Freud left Vienna uh, in 1938, because of the persecution of the Jews by the Nazis. In 1938, it was crystal matte mine and everything else. And Jules Thorne came to the UK and started Thorne Electrical Industries, which are massively successful thing. And you know, he he was a man who was always interested in the detail. Arnold Weinstock, these were people my father knew, ran the English GEC was renowned for, well, also I got to know through my father, was renowned for ringing up on a Friday night. You know, we'd ring a plant manager in GE in, in GC in Wales and say, you know, probably three or four or five levels down the organization on the organization chart and say, what's going on? And I thought, you know, I think, I think getting that balance uh, between the strategic and the, you know, I, I spoke to Arnold, uh, I had lunch with him, I remember, in London 
uh, before before he died, uh, and you know, son died tragic. Simon Weinstock died at the age of forty, and terrible for a father to bury a child. And and Jules Thorne buried his son as well. And I remember talking to Weinstock about what he regretted. It was interesting. He said, you know, he built cash mountains inside GEC. It was somewhat criticized in, in later years for not deploying that cash as aggressively. And he said he, 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 he tried joint ventures with Siemens or I can't remember who it was, Tyson, whatever. And he said those joint ventures never worked because you never knew who was in control. And it, one thing he regretted was not being a little bit more uh, aggressive. And I think we all go through that. I think that's you, you, you know, if you spot a trend, you, t you tend never to be as aggressive. And, you know, obviously, if that trend develops more and more positively, as you get through the trend and you look backwards, um, you know, say, why didn't I do more? So that's what, what Arnold was saying, really, was that, you know, he, he built these cash mountains, tried to deploy some of the cash through joint ventures, and that really didn't really didn't work as well because nobody had control. I don't believe in joint ventures either. Somebody has to run the run the company. We we you know we we basically have, have created an owner managed company as for you know fifty percent of the company is owned by people in it. And that's the critical thing. So you go to WPP, you start there post Saatchi, and the idea you know through effectively a reverse takeover, if you like, is to was it you know, did you have the idea to duplicate Saatchi's growth bigger? Was there a trend you you saw? In, in w, no, well, well, there, there are sort of three phases. Saatchi's was about globalization. I mean, the come to Jesus moment, if you like, was uh, in 1983. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review by a, a professor called Theodore Ted Levitt, famous marketing professor at HBS, which was a, a about globalization. What he said in that article was that consumers will consume everything in the same world globally. Yeah. Now, he he over it to make the point. We had, a, we had a celebration 20 years later in 2003 at HBS because that article was a seminal article. And, and Theodore Levitt, Ted Levitt, sadly he died of cancer a few, I think, months, years afterwards. But he did admit at that conference that he'd over it to make a point. Make a point. And, and you know, it wasn't, but the trend was there. So that's what, that's what, you know, Manhattan Landing, that famous BA advert, uh, that was about globalization. Uh, WPP was about globalization until the night, so from 85, say, through to 95. And then continued globalization, you know, with China and India uh, in particular, and Latin America and the Middle East and Africa, but, but also about the rise of the internet, which started in the mid-90s. And the rise of technology again, with the benefit of twenty twenty hindsight, we went quite quickly, but we didn't go quick enough. S four is about purely about. I mean, it, it, it actually S four might be a little bit more about localization and dare I say it, deglobalization. When you look at what's happening between the US and China, which is of great interest in in the antipodes, you know, with Orca and everything else. But you know, S four is about technology and growth. So. Slightly, so you've seen, you know, Buffett said when I joined, I think, Sarches, or maybe even when I, before, uh, you know, he was investing in, in Ogilvy, Ogilvy and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and IPG because it was a royalty on the growth of globalization. Mm. S4 is a royalty on the growth of the platforms and the hardware companies and the software companies. You know, today, this morning, everybody's nervous about Snap. I mean, it, you know, the, the shorts are out on Snap. But, you know, I, I think that's my view is going to be it's going to be short lived because, you know, I think the fundamental drift is towards digital and digital, digital is 50, 55, 5 percent. And which platform wins from an S4 point of view is irrelevant. Yep. It's a question of whether we can cover all the hardware companies, all the software companies and all the platforms whoever wins within that, you know, if the metaverse becomes more important, if the Unreal Engine becomes more important, if AR, VR, AI, voice, whatever the technology is, you know, we're looking at these technological developments and what's the impact on the sales function, the marketing function, 
and the tech function, you know, because we're now servicing the CMO, the CSO, the chief sales officer, and the CTO, the chief technology officer. So when, so Martin, when you, you, you know, you build this baby of yours, WPP, to a nearly 15 billion pound market cap, I think at the time that you leave, you... Yeah. Well, we got we got up to about twenty two, and then when then it, it, then it sagged it came to, back. to about it's six, sixteen billion when I left, and it's yeah. eleven today. Yeah, after that, it's, it's a bit. It's in the Saragasso Sea at the moment. So I think one of the you know and 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 to share with our audience, you know, today Sir Martin's a young seventy six, and to start a company in your seventies with this clear vision, I'd love you to share with our audience because I think it's so interesting. You turn around and say, okay, I can start again because I see this trend. Now, it's interesting what you mentioned is that um, uh, Charlie Munger says, you know, when you see an opportunity, you know, what he calls a lullapalooza moment, he says, you know, back the truck up. Don't, you know, go big. Don't go halfway. And he thinks that, you know, those opportunities don't come around often. This time you turn around, you've got a different structure, you've got a, a controlling stake or some significant yeah. influence over major issues. You know, when I looked at your, your story in WPP, you got you probably got inadequate equity, in my view, for the value you created and you had some people complaining you got paid a few million pounds when you created 50, million, 50 billion Australian dollars in, in value. What were the lessons from that that you've taken into this new venture and how did you get the clarity to, to go again? Well, you know, you know, I, I accept it. I mean, I went into WP, I went in with um, Preston Rabel, Warren Plastic Products, and, you know, I had about 16%. He had about 13%. We had 29%. We knew that, you know, if, if we did deals, we would dilute. I over-leveraged the company for the Ogilvy deal and paid the price when we had to restructure it in the 90s. Um, but you know that that having been said, you know that that was the the if that was an issue, that was an issue of the structure. With with yep. S four, you know, I put in forty million pounds. I went to ten institutions and said, you know, you can have twenty percent of the company. I'll have eighty as long as you underwrite underwrite my. They put in another ten, and uh, as long as you underwrite the first deal, which was Media Monks, and, you know, and then I have ten percent of the equity, and and effectively through. Uh, through a, a, a private equity type carry, you have another 10. So it's 20% of the company by and large is, is certainly in my mind. What, what, and that's, you know, that's fine. And uh, it works well. I mean, the motivation was I, you know, I was 73. Yeah, I, I'm reasonably fit. Um, but my, my view mentally and physically, others might have different view. Um, didn't want to do play golf. Uh, didn't want to or surf. Uh, didn't want. Didn't want to or play cricket um, inadequately. Uh, or or you know do portfolio stuff or do private equity stuff. Uh, I still enjoy this type of thing. Um, we, had, we had done sort of two sort of shell operations, if you like, both with Sarches and and with WPP. And I thought you know doing it. I, I wanted to focus on growth because I I thought I was too old to struggle with no growth. And, you know, if I look at back at WPP, the, the, the best year was 2016. Uh, 2017 was a tough year. You know, there's some criticism for the flattening of top line growth, which everybody suffered from, but, you know, uh, maybe we didn't move quickly enough into some of the areas that we, we should have done. And certainly we didn't change the structure as rapidly as we probably, and we talked about horizontality, which is the key issue. I mean, all WPP have done is create more verticals, stronger yeah. verticals, which means you have stronger barons. And my view is that they they will collapse in and on on, on themselves eventually. Uh, we'll see. There'll be that that company will eventually, I think, get broken up because it, you know it's just it's a manager managed company with an enormous bureaucracy. You talk to the clients; the clients are becoming increasingly concerned about paying for what they describe as useless overhead. And I think the structures have to, to change. So creating a unitary structure where you eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy is important. When you create stronger verticals, you create more problems. You know, you have 
P- PR companies hiring creative directors, media companies hiring creative directors, creative agencies hiring media directors, and the whole thing becomes a, 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 a sort of a quantum competing, building. Yes, yeah, you know, competing, competing, stronger competing verticals. And by the way, you can create growth inside the company by shifting parts of it. You know, if you collapse the Ford agency, which was called GTB, which is the largest client and you shove most of it inside VML, VML appears, or why VML, Y and R, it appears to grow, but you have to look at the, the whole. I mean, looking at the whole is really more than the, 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 the parts. But, you know, I, I, I think I looked at it in, in, in uh, 2018 and thought I wanted to focus on the growth. And also, I, you know, I, I think the board at WPP handled everything particularly the chairman, in a, let me put it politely, inadequate way. Uh, you know, I, I, I think some of the decisions they made subsequent to my departure, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is the sale, and this was all done, I think, emotionally and vindictively, uh, the sale of Globan, a 20% stake in a technology services company, which is in the sweet spot, of WPP's, of WPP's digital strategy when I was there and subsequent to my departure. Yep. To sell that was inane. I, I said, I've said it's criminal, and I think it is. And it was 20% of the company with, at $52. And I think as I speak, if I can, I think it's, it's about 308. That is a loss to WPP shareholders, including myself of well over $2 billion against a market cap of 11. Of, well, 11 sterling, Go ahead. $15, yeah. $16, $15, right? That's one. Teledirect in your area, uh, there's a company that Ogilvy had 40% of, sold in 2018. I don't know what, but if you look at the prospectus for Teledirect, it went, went public a few weeks ago in Asia at $3 billion. That's another billion. So that's three billion out of sixteen billion that has been foregone by, I would say, sort of, you know, the sort of the, the bureaucratic stroke of the pen. You know, Martin's gone. Let's get rid of those. You know, because I, I would never have sold the Globant stake. And, and, was, and it's always sold. harder to and find. I, I would, ne- I would never have sold the Teledirect site. I mean, it's, it's completely inane. Completely. Inane. It's, it's, it's very hard to buy very good businesses. Um, and and often well, a lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of, a lot of effort, I can tell you a lot of effort went into buying twenty percent of Globant. We bought it privately at eleven dollars. It went public at twenty two, and as I say, it's now about three hundred and ten. Teledirect was forty percent. Excellent business. I don't, I don't think that the Ogilvy people had in Asia had a strong relationship with Teledirect. It was a bad relationship. But you know, if you work, you see again, this is the devil in the detail thing. You know, it's a bureaucrat sitting in sea container house would say, let's get rid of it. If that bureaucrat spent 10 seconds investigating it, you know, instead of buggering off home at six o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, it, it, you know, it would have been a different answer. It does, it, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. Yeah. You just sit there and say, like a pudding and say, I'm not going to, you know, do anything with it. It means you try and work with the guy at Teledirect or you try and work with the management. You know, I met people used to say to me, well, the, the management at, at um, Globant is very difficult. I said, well, look, hold on a second. They've taken the business from Buenos Aires into Latin America, into America. You know, they created now it's an $11 billion company from nothing. Teledirect created a $3 billion company from nothing. Maybe they know something that we don't know. Yeah, so maybe some humility is uh, is required yeah, to the, work. It's, well the, with it's the, the arrogance of the bureaucracy, and, and you know a lot of these decisions are emotional decisions rather than rational ones. So you know, so the answer to come back to you know, I have a point to prove in relation to S four. So you you jump into S four. I'd love to explore the the horizontality idea. Yeah. And very strongly, you know, I can feel with you what what I call a founder's mentality 
certainly there's a book called Founders Mentality by Bain and Co., which I think is very insightful. Um, how have you been able to, with you know your first acquisition, Media Monk, significant business? How have Meet you- merger, oh, merger, Brett. Oh, no, oh, not oh, sorry. We do half share. Sorry, yeah, 50-50, absolutely. Partnership, I like to call them. Yes, um, yeah. And, and how, do you, how do you keep this owner's mentality uh, uh, and support? These? Well, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not easy because particularly when we've gone to a unibranded approach, so BizTech in Australia, yeah. whatever, you know, destined, all of them, you know, become media monks. Samoga so in Colombia becomes media monks, Jan 3, you know, et cetera, uh, decoded. Uh, so... And everybody has their affinity. You know, they've started in the garage or in the basement, and, you know, like like me with a clean sheet of paper, you know, three years ago. Um, you know, we're all committed to to our brand. So it's not easy, but we, we try and bring them together because we think that unit, you know, going back to what we said before, having the fragmentation is a is a is a killer. Unification, we, we think, you know, when companies come in, what do they look for when they join us? And and by the way. Just to emphasize again, we're growing at 50%. Yeah. We said to the market, we'll grow at 40% this year, organic, right? Yeah. The actual reported rates have doubled that because deals. So remember that we're growing organically very strongly. The deals yeah. get the attention. But on the deals, we bring in companies probably with 25, 50, 75 million, 100 million of revenue. Uh, they look for, I think it's four things. One, one is they look, uh, you know, they built a reputation. They look for geographical penetration because we, we're in 33 countries. They look at that and they say, you know, we can get into Asia if they're American, let's say. We get into Asia, Latin America, EMEA, you know, they're North American or the US or Canadian. They get into Latin America. They can get into EMEA, Middle East and Africa, Europe. Eastern Europe, they can get into Asia Pacific uh, with us. That's one thing. They look at us and say they want more talent. They've got six and a half thousand digital specialists in those 30, 30 countries and 57 cities or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they can get access to capital. You know, they're private companies. We don't have unlimited capital, but we have a bit of capital. So they get access to capital and they don't have to leverage up their business and take risk. Because, you know, if you're a great business in Sydney or Melbourne, you know, you want to do stuff in Asia or South America, wherever it is, or America, you know, that, that puts stresses and strains on the core business. And if you have to go and borrow money to do it or, you know, give up equity, maybe you don't, you don't want to do that. So they, they look for, for, for capital, they look for talent, they look for geographical access. And then the fourth thing is client access. I'm not saying that we have unlimited access, but we certainly... You know, we've developed a reputation for good or bad, and um, we, 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 we offer them access. So it's those four dimensions that people can think about in relation to us and how, and how we operate. And, and when, you, when you sat down in 18 with the vision of, of what you hope to build, how close yeah, I mean, was your you, vision? Yeah, like yeah, how I, well, yeah first of all, First three-year plan was we'll dub, 19 to 21 will double the size of the company. Second three-year plan, 20 to 22 will double the size of the company organically. So that's a 25% growth rate. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in you know, look, look go to back. So mission, create the new model and disrupt the old. So we're, we're Amazonian and Tesla, if I can be so bold. The execution of four things. One, digital only, because digital is 50% of the market. And more than 50%, it will be 70% by 2024. It's growing at 15 to 20%. So we're in the, the sweet spot. You know, it's the Wayne Gretzky quote, I skate to where the pups, where the pups, pups. pups going to be, not yep. where it is now. Secondly, Holy Trinity model, data-driven development, uh, creation, development, production, distribution of content, advertising content through digital media in a continuous iterative leap. Thirdly, faster, better, cheaper. We go to market as agility, understanding the digital ecosystem, and then doing it efficiently. And then the fourth one is a unitary structure. That's the background. Yeah. The, ex- the execution is, we say, you know, first plan, 1921, double. Second plan, 20 to 22, double. Third plan, 21 to 23, double. We're in the midst of creating our 22-4 plan. I think we will 
have the same objective. So we're looking to grow top line and bottom line at 25% at a margin of roughly around 20, 21, 22% post central cost so so pre central cost maybe 22 23 that's that's the the sort of the approach fantastic i i love the story about you and um, david ogilvy and 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 that story i i, I want to recommend you know reading a lot more on sir martin and his, and his adventures i hope you've enjoyed the time we've spent together i i found so Martin and, and a lot that, that he, he has written and shared. There's a great deal of a, a, amazing um, sharing on YouTube, which is how I first came to, to meet you from, I think, in one of the, uh, one of the interviews you did with one of, the, one of these uh, classes. You just dropped a note at the end where you said, oh, and if anyone wants to, um, has any questions on my uh, takeover thoughts, just email me. And you gave your email address. So that's exactly what I did late one night. Um, I've enjoyed our time together, so Martin, I appreciate all yeah, of your okay, willingness. Right. So, yeah. so thank you so right. much. Have Very a terrific thanks, day Brett. in London, and um, I hope to catch up soon. Yeah, I hope to see you in Sydney or Melbourne very soon. Thanks for listening to the Be Better Up show. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Have a great day.